Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Curtis Eller. I'm Darren Hushak. And we're presenting this recital of electronic and electroacoustic music to you tonight. Um, we've been working with uh, Dr. Christopher Hopkins and Music 490i for four or five semesters now. Um, we both completed uh, the music technology minor at Iowa State and decided we wanted to um, keep working on this kind of stuff. So um, we've had a lot of uh, pieces and different projects that we've done over the years, and we decided that we wanted to put together this, this showcase of all of them for you. Um, so the purpose of the talk really is to introduce you guys to what kinds of music you're gonna be hearing and what to listen for. Um, so everybody's used to standard uh, Western music, um, things you hear on the radio, classic, standard Western classical music, but you're not exposed to a lot of electronic or electroacoustic music. So what kinds of things do you guys normally um, look for in music? Good lead. Good beat, okay, so rhythm. Audience participation. <laughs> guitars. Guitars, okay, and guitars yeah. have things like notes that they play. Chords, chord structures. Mm -hmm. Chord progressions. Chord progressions, yep, those are all very common things. Um, so you have things like melodies, harmonies, rhythms. Uh, some of the music that we're playing tonight doesn't have any of those things. Now. Stick around, it's, there, there's a good reason that you should listen to. Um, so there's a, a style of music called electroacoustic, and um, the, if you look at your programs, the um, pieces titled Chimeric Devotion and A2 in the first half of the program um, are essentially composed electroacoustic music. Um, those are taken, uh, they use samples of things recorded from either the natural world or sometimes they're synthesized, um, things are recorded in a studio. Um, it could be anything from just grabbing the sound of chains clacking together, birds chirping, um, hitting bowls with spoons, and you use things like that to compose music. Now, um, as I mentioned, they don't always contain things like melody and harmony. So, what might they contain? Does anybody have any suggestions to what music without those components has? All right, so uh, that's why we said that to talk. So if you break down music into you know, its m most basic components, you have things like gesture and timbre. Um, and especially the things that I ha have written, those two pieces that I just mentioned, um, those are um, focused on gesture and timbre. Um, gesture, it, you hear that um, evident in melody and harmony all the time. It's how the line phrases and moves throughout um, the piece. And so you can get that type of motion and that type of emotion coming from a piece of music even if you don't have a specific melody. Um, so those are the type, types of things that we try and convey using electroacoustic or acousmatic music. Um, another, another major component of that is repetition or feigning repetition. Um, an idea is introduced like a gesture or you know, in, in common Western music, a melody. And then oftentimes, coming back later in the piece, that melody is reintroduced, sometimes the same, sometimes different. And that, that sort of thing is, that abstract thought is very, very similar in, in electroacoustic music. There's you know, a particular sound or a particular warping that one may do to a sound and it's done to another sound. Or those, those sorts of things also appear in electroacoustic music. So it's, it's kind of the same, but not really. <laughs> So it's really stripping away those superfluous things like melody and notes and getting down to the real honest music below. So another very cool thing um, that can be evident in electroacoustic or standard um, uh, Western music is spatialization of sound. And Darren is an expert in that. So um, yeah, I've been I've been interested in the spatialization of, of sound for approximately three years now. I've put a lot of work and effort into figuring out various ways. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the standard 5.1 surround sound stereo system that you get with DVDs and you can get on a home theater system. And the basic idea behind 5.1 surround sound is I, as a, you know, a mix engineer for a major motion picture, 
will mix a 5.1 surround mix and that gets sent to consumers and I'm assuming that everybody's going to have a speaker layout that's roughly similar to two speakers in front at approximately a 60 degree angle apart, a center speaker, two rears at 90 degrees, and a subwoofer. Um, so as I, as I mix and I move things around this false space that I'm generating by, by having various amplitudes and various speakers, I can move this object. And so as I'm sitting in my mix location, you know, in my nice studio with the perfectly laid out to the degree speakers, I can get a very good feel as to where I'm placing this particular RO object. Um, the issue with 5.1 and many systems like it is you go into somebody else's house who when they have, you know, uh, they, they put their home theater in a room that's got a weird angle in one wall and so their, their rear speakers have to actually sit this way and oftentimes what happens is you still get a sense of spatialization but you lose a lot of accuracy um, with 5.1 surround. So what I have uh, the, the topic that I have delved very deeply into is a topic called ambisonics. Um, and I won't go into the, the math, it's relatively complicated to get into that portion of it, but essentially um, ambisonics converts a set of audio to four channels, and it's just four channels of audio, and within those four channels contains all of the spatial information of that audio. And I can take those four channels to any location and with any speaker layout and provide a custom decode to those four channels and that speaker layout can then reproduce accurately the same spatialization that I heard in my mix room. Um, and so a lot of the things that we're going to be doing, you'll hear things spreading around and spinning around the room. Um, um, almost all of that that we're doing tonight is through Ambisonics with a lot of the plugins and instruments that I've built in the past couple of years. So if you look around the room, you'll see lots of very, very nice speakers um, hung up here. So the room has eight separate channels. Normally you'll just hear two on stereo, you have left and right. Um, so pay attention, um, most of our pieces exploit this, and so listen for sounds coming from different areas, moving around the room as, as they move through different gesture, um, spatial gestures as well. Um, so those are some things you should make sure that you listen to um, throughout the pieces. If you're not finding some normal anchor that you're used to hearing, like a melody or notes. So um, we're going to go through um, the program briefly here, and we're going to give you a, a brief preview of what each piece is, is going to be. And so you know a little bit of what went into it and how to um, appreciate it the best. Um, so we'll talk about fanfare for the comic crowd at the end. Um, but Ugrid um, is a, actually it has things like notes and rhythms in it, and it focuses entirely on rhythms, specifically Euclidean rhythms. Um, so it's a, uh, a controller that I built for experimenting with those, and so I've scored a piece um, that moves through them. And so Euclidean rhythms are a series of, um, you, you're given a series of beats essentially, and then you take um, a smaller set of notes and space them as evenly as possible throughout those beats. And then that ends up generating most of the rhythms that you hear in world music, um, as well as lots of other interesting ones. So we'll be exploring some of those. Um, we talked about the um, diffusions here, is what we call them. So the performance style for a lot of electroacoustic music is you have something that's pre-composed. Um, it might be a sound file or multiple sound files for different channels. And um, to a lot of people, it looks like the uh, person isn't actually performing it, um, because it seems like they're pressing a space bar and letting something happen in the room. Um, but as uh, when I diffuse those pieces, I'll actually be sitting here in the audience with you, and then using an iPad, I'll control the spatialization of the audio um, because every space is different, and we want the piece to fit the space that we're in. Um, and then we have another piece called a walk that Darren talked about. Uh, so a walk uh, was a major, a, a major project for us. I think what was that about a year and a half worth of work on a walk. Um, so a walk is. Uh, Curtis mentioned the, the Euclid, um, and he developed um, an interface and a controller for the Euclidean rhythm generator. Um, and that controller, and we'll, we'll probably talk about it more when we get to it, um, it's called a haptics device. Um, and so haptics is sort of the, um, the, the tie into the third sense uh, that you can get um, from a virtual space. So, you, you know, normally uh, you deal with you know, when, when you're dealing with virtual environments, you can see things, you can see objects, you can move around, and you can hear them. Um, and you know, we've been dealing with video and audio for countless years already. Um, but the uh, 
what haptics does is it adds in the sense of touch to that. So there can be objects in this 3D space, and haptics allows me to feel those 3D objects, even though they don't physically exist in the real world. And this haptics pen, it has gyroscopes and motors and whatnot in it to, you know, and it communicates with the computer as to whether or not I will have touched this virtual object, and it will actually push back so I can feel a cube or feel a sphere. Um, and so a walk um, is an experiment in using this, uh, this haptics device as an instrument. Um, and so we've developed uh, several scenes that um, the performer will walk through. And you'll get to see the scenes projected on the screen behind us. Um, and it's, what, what we've been able to do is with, with this sort of thing is we can, we can grab interesting parameters from it, such as if I just have a square, just a flat square, I can grab the parameter of where on the square I've touched it, which is similar to um, something that we've had as far as music controllers go, as an XY controller. I have just a little joystick, and with that I can control two parameters of music at the same time. Where the pen gets really interesting is I can measure the force, or the angle at which I touch the square, and um, in the piece of lock we actually exploit those uh, parameters, and they map to various aspects of sound. Uh, and so, Curtis mentioned a while ago um, motifs and gestures, and that's a perfect example of literally a gesture, and he's going to be gesturing with the pen throughout that piece. Yep, so mapping physical gestures directly to aural gestures, basically. Um, deep note is a piece that you will recognize when you hear it, so we'll leave that to your ears. Um, byte is a live coding piece, um, which means that I'll be writing code um, on stage, and there's some pre-written code as well. Um, and I'll be using um, essentially sampling instruments and controlling those by writing algorithms to generate notes. And so um, this is the first time that I'll be performing a, a live coding piece in public, uh, but I've just done it in studios before. So um, with all of these, though, you notice we've got a lot of technology up here. Man, we're going to have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> so we fully expect to have some problems for running too. So. No, we don't. Nothing. No. Nothing. We don't. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Okay. Uh, I can't even remember all the things that we're doing up here, but that's why we have a program, so we know what to do. So we know what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, augmented Reflections for Two Players is a trombone quartet arranged for two players, and um, essentially what we do is Darren and I will be playing into microphones, and we will be controlling a sequencer with our um, feet. We'll be pressing a foot pedal, and then that'll advance... Um, a set of cues that determine which uh, pitch shifts, essentially, are given to um, a set of electronics. So we'll give it one input note, and then we'll determine this a chord, essentially, that's played um, based on that. And so that's uh, that a trombone quartet for two players. That one will be your more traditional Western music. Um, so if you're, if you're getting weirded out by that point in the program, that one should bring you back home a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the, the next one that's on the program is called Auras, um, and that was... Um, we, we have actually decided to scratch that one. There were a, a mountain of technical issues and timing issues and everything. Um, but I can, I can talk a little bit about what Auras was. And it's essentially um, using sound to its fullest extent. Um, this one was kind of my, my piece that I've been trying to work on for a long period of time. It, it exploits the Amazonics to the fullest. Uh, it, would, it has actual three dimensions. One thing I forgot to mention about ambisonics is you can actually spatialize in three dimensions, which is something that 5.1 can't do. Um, and so there, you know, there were objects whirring around and moving up and down even. Um, but like I said, it's just a mountain of technical issues. So look forward to that at a future concert. Yes. Oh, exactly. Um, so, and then at the end, it just says untitled. We have a, a surprise piece for you that everybody again will recognize, okay. and hopefully. And uh, it was in the news recently, so actually. Um, but no, we hope you'll enjoy that. And then fanfare the, for the comic crowd is a very cool piece that Darren um, created. Um, so you'll notice that there's three microphones <coughs> kind of scattered around here, and we've also asked you to leave your cell phones on, uh, which is kind of odd for most performances. Uh, fanfare for the common crowd, so electroacoustic pieces, like Curtis said, are recorded samples of things, stuff, you know, whatever might be happening, you know, clinking a bowl. Um, fanfare for the common crowd is essentially a live composed electroacoustic piece. So the microphones 
that are sitting here are actually going to be taking in input from the audience, um, and I'm going to be warping that, looping that, mashing that, and it's going to be a fun time. So if you enter your phone number in the back, um, one of our great friends will be calling you um, just for the next 15 minutes. After that, you'll never get another phone call from us, we promise you. And so let your phone ring. Um, that will be picked up by the microphones. Um, if you don't worry about being quiet during this, the idea is that the sounds that the crowd makes are used to create the piece. So if you're silent, guess what it's going to sound like? That, yeah. So just laugh, talk. I'll turn it up yeah. enough where we get the AC noise and the HVAC going. Yeah. It be a so uh, one, one minor note, once, once common uh, fanfare for the common crowd concludes, we will ask you to turn your cell phones back on silent. So. Right. And I appreciate that uh, pretty much everybody here is sitting right in the center of the room. That's awesome. We've been talking about the spatialization of audio. You will get its best effect if you're right in the center of the room. So you, sir, have the best seat in the house. Um, so if you're in um, against the walls, we'd encourage you to move into the center. Um, don't be worried about feeling awkward about doing that. Just do it. Um, you'll get a better experience out of it. And um, you'll get to actually experience Amazonics and uh, spatialized audio to its fullest effect, which is something that's uh, super cool. So that is a, a good look at the pieces we'll be giving uh, in, the, in the recital tonight. Um, the program notes go to a little more depth, talk about some other details, and then um, while we're setting up the three pieces, we'll give you some more um, anecdotes about how we created pieces, etc. So um, we will retreat to backstage to finish uh, preparing, at least mentally, for the recital. And again, let your cell phones ring. Don't be quiet. Until the concert starts, this is a seven. The, the fanfare is a, is a great one. And be part of it. <laughs> Thank you.